Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Tell me about it. Now, this is like a dream come true to talk to you. Oh, true come on. Legend. <laughs> you know you're a legend. <laughs> now, my first question is, though, am I going to get the $10,000 sur surviving the Zoom call with you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Do you think I'm going to manage that? Yes, yes, yes. The answer is always yes. <laughs> I'm horrified that something's going to jump out from behind the TV and kill me before this no. is over. You have a, a woman with a scarf around her neck behind you. That is not a woman, actually. That's Bobcat Goldthwait. Oh, it is. <laughs> Police Bob Academy. You, you have Bobcat Goldthwait behind you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a portrait from Police Academy. <laughs> it's actually kind of cool. Very cool. Well, thank you. Um, so my first question for you is Edith Cranston is really a true monster. And I say this because she takes abused kids and then has their abuser kill them. Now, can you defend her and, and kind of make her more of a sympathetic character in terms of that? 100%. She is not a bad person. She's a woman who's um, been a caregiver to children. She's got a positive, great relationship with her husband who she's been married to for over 30 years. And these kids destroy her. She's a fragile woman actually, who is, becomes, who, is, who turns to evil finds her because she's been made so vulnerable by these kids who are abusing her. And she deteriorates, she, de she deteriorates to a very, uh, very sad and bad place. As we, as I don't want to give it away, but um, I did. I disagree with you. I don't think she's a monster at all. I think the kids are the monsters. But I don't think I've ever seen Freddy Krueger do something that evil. Because what she pulls off on these kids is pretty hardcore and cold blooded. It is, but it's letting them look at their. She's making them look at themselves, and and these are kids who have. They. She's teaching a very harsh lesson but the harshest lesson is what she does to herself and what they have done to her. That's a good question. I mean, it's, I don't, but I, I totally see it the opposite. I see the kids as the monsters and yeah, she does. That's part of entertainment though, too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, she, I mean, come on, on, give her a break. <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> She's got to do something horrible to keep the audience watching. <laughs> so. she does. Now you say that they always use the term phoning it in. You have to actually phone it in in this movie uh, quite a bit. And I'm wondering, were you allowed to interact with these guys on camera or like off camera while you were doing this? Or did you go somewhere else and kind of phone in for the call? I phone I, I, the, in, in real life. I mean, I, we didn't, I was not on set with them at all. I mean, that was, oh, gee whiz. Now what? I lost you. You did what? There I am. I just lost you for a second. Oh. <laughs> um, the... Um, I, I mean, the actual, in terms of the actual physical production, I was not there. I was actually on the, calling it in on the phone. Timothy recorded it. And um, I, and the horror really comes from the visuals and from the situation of who these kids are forced to, they're forced to confront. It is pretty horrible what she does. Well, I want to go into the fact that it is set up to be a franchise if it wants to be. But the one thing about this is that this is a very set specific group of kids that have tormented this lady. Right. So where does Edith go from here in terms of continuing to scare or get revenge on kids? Does she go find somebody else and show them the way? To use this phone call? I don't know. Maybe you've got to write the sequel. <laughs> I don't know. I, those are very, very titillating questions, but I don't have answers to that. I don't know. Um, she's going to see this, these kids in hell is where, the way she sort of leaves it. Um, I don't think she has to torment anybody else. I think she's satisfied at the end of this. I really do. I think she's, she's, she has satisfied herself that she has made them suffer the way she suffered now, now that an eye for an eye i don't know i mean do you believe in that in that philosophy i don't know those are very those are profound questions actually well the ending leaves it kind of open we don't necessarily see that all of these kids have 
died. So, I mean, it leaves well, it a little ambiguous for the future, I would think. Well, that's, a, you know, those are, it's great. I mean, that's all very, those are very interesting per perceptions also, because I think everybody will sort of take, come away at the end with, uh, did she or is she done or is she not done? I mean, is, has she, in, as an actor or as the character, I feel I have, I am satisfied that I have shown them, I have taken from them what they took from me. And, um, so, it, so I don't know that if, if we, there was a sequel of any kind, that would be up to the imagination of the writer. Well, in speaking of, in terms of creating this like boogie monster that may be around for a while, you do get one great scene where we see you in the flesh and you've got the black dripping from your mouth and you look like you literally crawled out of hell. Tell me what it's like to do that day for the shoot, especially in terms of this black stuff we see coming out of everybody's mouth. Is that something that's fun for you to do or is that just like, ah, this is gross, let me get this over with? It's kind of fun, but it also was very, it was a really difficult day. Also, what's difficult for me always is, you know, the smoke effect they use. And we were in a closed room. It was really hard. It was actually quite a difficult shoot because we were in a closed room. It was like very late. It was like one or two o'clock in the morning. I'd been in the makeup a long time and um, it was a very st strenuous, emotionally strenuous scene. So uh, fun, I felt we got a great take, which is what's in the movie. So for that, that's always fun and satisfying to feel like you fulfilled, you have fulfilled your job and the character's experience, you know, with, with your with your work. Um, but it was physically actually quite. Uh, it was is quite difficult. I was having trouble with all the smoke, and it made me not feel good. And actually, they ended up turning it down a bit. That's all very technical stuff. But if you, they let the smoke in too soon, it's 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 really it's it's supposed to be safe. Mm, safe my ass. <laughs> it's real, the way I say it, I say it, I think it's not it's not really that good for you to be breathing it for that long. And in a closed environment with no, there was no air, other air coming in. So it was hard. That was a difficult I, uh, experience physically to pull off. And no one knew it was going to be that, like, like that. You know, I mean, I worked on the material and Timothy gave me a great direction for how to deliver the material. I helped write that particular monologue w with the writer. I was, I contributed thoughts and ideas that I wanted to have in there. And so I was very satisfied with that part of it, but it was physically difficult. Well, and we are officially in Oscar season, and apparently, as far as I can see, you're the only one bringing it right now. Oh, so, ba oh baby. <laughs> so what does Lynn Shea's Oscar speech for the call sound say, like? I would say, thank you for calling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank, thank you all for calling. That would be my Oscar speech. <laughs> And then, of course, to thank Timothy and Pablo and all the other actors. Well, in speaking on, you say she's not a true monster, right? And I'm just wondering, the most, when I hear the name Edith, I don't know if you think this, but the person that immediately comes to my mind is Edith Bunker, who is <laughs> probably the most, you know, warm-hearted, kindest person that was ever on TV back in the day. And I'm wondering, did you kind of look two other Ediths, such as Edith Bunker? Did no, no, yeah, I'll cut you off right there, no. I, it her, her name didn't even occur to me as being anything than other, something her mother named her. <laughs> and I didn't have any association with it other than that was my first name. You've got a vivid imagination. <laughs> well, when you hear Edith Cranston though, I mean, that is a great horror movie name. So you I'm think it's a sitcom like, we did? Is that what you're trying to tell me? No, no, no. no. I'm saying he, it, you got the Cranston on the end, which is like hard. That like, right. Cranston, you know, there's Brian Cranston. But Cranston sounds like, you know, sounds like the, the woman that's looking through the windows, not to use another <laughs> sitcom, but on Bewitched. I can't remember what her name is. Uh, you know, old Miss Kravitz. So, oh, like, oh yeah. I, um, oh, gosh. I'm blanking on her name, too. She's wonderful, but I... No. <laughs> Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my my um, description of 
of Edith is, is as given in the film. I mean, she's a, she's a good woman. But I think what this film is about is what evil, is what meanness can turn people into. And she is really destroyed by these, these kids who do not leave her alone and humiliate her and try to harm her in every way they can. And it destroys her. Being mean is bad. That's kind of the, the theme in a weird way of this story is that being mean damages people and ultimately damages you. Yes. Want to make it a philosophical little sentence. I mean, that's what I really think this is about. Now, I know everybody's going to ask you, but you are working with Tobin Bell, who is also a huge, like yourself, horror icon. He's one of the biggest horror icons out there right now. Bigger than but, me. <laughs> uh, no. I think you're number one right now. If horror icons in American cinema, if you're not number one, you're at least in the top three. And I'd like dare you to name two other, two other actors right now working in horror cinema. Not that you're well, specifically horror, but I'm just saying. I'm just grateful. Know. I'm just grateful to be working and he was ex ex just wonderful to be around and work with. I'd never met him before and um, we had a really nice relationship and um, it, he was very easy to work with. It was all very good. Very, very good, I thought. So we, and I think you believe that we had a real kind, I think he revealed things about me through our, our scenes we had together that are not really written in the story so much. I mean, there was a real, real, really positive love relationship between the two of us. Now, I'm almost out of time. And since it's October, what does Lynn Shay do for the Halloween season? I know this year's a lot different than any other year we've dealt with before. I know they're shutting down trick-or-treating here in Los Angeles. Right. But right. what normally would, would your Halloween look like? Well, I mean, it's interesting when when we were doing Insidious, it was always going to Universal Horror Night, which was really fun to do with all this sort of. But I generally, probably this year, I'll just lock my doors and drink a glass of wine. <laughs> I, I'm not a big I'm not a big celebrator of. Um, I've never been that involved in 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 the season and the world of Halloween as a lot of horror aficionados are. Um, I appreciate it, and it's fun. Um, my, the last time I dressed up, I was 11 as a panda, <laughs> other than going to Jason Blum's Halloween party, which was really fun. I dressed up as Snow Mercy, <laughs> which is another long story. She's um, Joe Bashara, who did the music for, for all the Insidious films. Um, his other half is a, a, a beautiful woman who, who named Snow Mercy. She's very tall and very exotic. So I kind of I dressed up as her. <laughs> that, was, that was my costume. And we have some great pictures we took together. She dressed up as a witch. <laughs> but anyway, but I probably won't do very much. I mean, I've, um, we've been robbed a bit, I feel right now in general mm -hmm. of, of uh, just sort of that abandoned joy. You know, you can still have fun, but it's, it's got, it doesn't have that same feel to it. So so be it. I hope things get better. I was going to say, that's why we're glad we've, we've got you in the call coming out. Right Thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited. I think people are going to really respond to the film. I think oh, yeah. it's beautifully done. And I thank you so much for, um, for your interest. And you've got to come up with <laughs> the sequel. Now it's your job. <laughs> no, I can't. Do and he is Bunker is not going to be in it. <laughs> I'm sure that they're already working on a sequel. All right. <laughs> such sequel potential. I mean, if you can figure out where she goes next. That's a good more but, but I, See, story. in my mind, she's done. She did her, she did it. She, she gave them what they deserved and she's, she can now sleep in peace in that, hell. That never happens in a horror movie. All right. <laughs> You're never done. You're always coming back. Anyways, I have to go because I have a heart out so the next person can jump on, but I am so enamored with you. You are so awesome. Oh, this was a great interview. I totally love talking to you. It was just, it's really fun. Thank I will you so see you. Looking forward to the next one. See you in hell, buddy. Yes. Yeah. Look out. <laughs> There's something behind you. Do you see that? <laughs> Wait, let me show you what's behind me. There you go. <laughs> Deserved. 
Really? Yes. <laughs> anyway, all good. Thank you again for a great interview. It was really fun. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.